We're now going to integrate our study of propositional logic with what's called quantifier logic. To that end, we're going to add to and modify our current notational system. One of the things that you should bear in mind, however, going all the way back to the beginning of our course, is that the system we're embarking on studying now builds upon our previous work. Let me try and make some sense of that in what follows. First, you know that we've been looking at atomic and compound sentences. Those atomic and compound sentences involve individuals. So think about the Tarski's world notation. We have individuals A through E. But any individual, that is, any named entity, is known as an individual constant, and a sentence involving an individual constant exclusively is a sentence that's called a singular sentence. So whether your sentence is simple or atomic, as in the first example, A is a dodec, or the sentence is compound, Al is adorable and Shazi is sweet, it's still the case that the sentences are about individually named things. But you and I both know that not all of our sentences involve individually named things. Take a look at the four examples that involve classes of things. All dogs bark. Cats and dogs are animals. No logic exercises are easy. Some dogs are not friendly. Each of these is an example of, respectively, an affirmative universal, an affirmative universal, a negative universal, and a particular or existential negative. Notice the language that I've just used. We're talking about, in the first case, the domain of things that are dogs in relation to things that bark. How many dogs are we talking about? Every one of them. Hence, the universal. The same goes for dogs and cats. We've got the domain of cats and the domain of dogs and the domain of animals. Notice that in neither case, that is, we're talking now about the class of cats, the class of dogs, are we naming this or that dog, this or that cat. Moreover, we're not naming a specific animal. So what we're doing in quantifier logic is we're dealing in generalities. And there's a logic that goes with this notion of dealing with generalities. Now let's take a look at the last example, some dogs are not friendly. Notice the difference between the first three examples. All dogs bark, cats and dogs are animals, the universal is implicit, it's not explicitly stated, and no logic exercises are easy. Here, like with the first example, the universal is explicitly stated. The difference between the first and the third of the universals is that we have an affirmative in the first case, a negative in the third case. The implicit universal has to do in the second case with our general understanding of what constitutes the way that we classify cats and dogs, namely animals. On the other hand, the existential claim some dogs are not friendly, is a much more restricted claim. We can replace the word or quantifier sum with at least one, so that we get the claim at least one dog is not friendly. Okay, so now let's begin to look at how we are going to add to and adjust our existing system of logical notation. Remember, we're going to use all of the same connectives that we already know. Negation, conjunction, disjunction, conditional, 
and biconditional. We're also now going to be able to quantify the universal claim and the existential claim. So in addition to our connectives, we're first going to add the symbol for the universal quantifier, which you can see as a, an effectively an upside down A, and the symbol for the existential quantifier, which is a backward E. Now let's go back up to these examples. We're going to also preserve our predicates, right, whether they are single place or multiple place, but we are going to want to substitute for names something else. Why? Because remember, in quantifier logic, we don't use names, right? That we don't get to that level of specificity. So what are we going to do? We're going to replace names with variables. Think of your variable as like a placeholder. Right? So the individual constant, which names a, an entity specifically, is replaced in the quantified sentence with a variable. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. Horses are fleet-footed. Logic students are smart. Notice that we're not talking about a specifically named horse, like Mr. Ed. We're not talking about a specifically named logic student. Uh, like Kalinda. Instead, we're talking about the domain of discourse involving horses and fleet-footed things. We're talking about the domain of discourse uh, involving logic students and things that are smart. So my emphasis on the word things tells us that we're talking about these unnamed entities. So we're going to use in the parenthetical variables. Notice at the very bottom of this slide you see T U V W X Y Z. Most commonly you'll see X and Y, uh, but that doesn't mean that those are the only variables that you can use. Alright, let's start putting some ideas together. We said that we are maintaining all of our connectives we're also maintaining our predicates. We're maintaining the basic notational structure where the predicate uh, appears with the first letter of the predicate word capitalized. And then in parentheses, we're replacing our uh, name with a variable. We're also introducing the scope of the domain of discourse. What do I mean by that? Well, we've got a quantifier that tells us the scope is restricted to uh, an existential for the predicate in question or predicates in question or universal, which is restricted to, again, the predicate or predicates in question. Think about the universal this way. It says everything for all things X, all, every, any. Our textbook prefers the word every or everything, and I will follow uh, that lead, but I'll also use uh, other language that reflects the universal. The existential quantifier is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, can be understood using the phrase there is at least one or at least one thing, but also some something. Now, understanding which quantifier to use is very often straightforward, but there are going to be times when you need to use your understanding of the meanings of our ordinary language sentences to grasp or properly interpret which quantifier is intended by the utterer of the sentence in question. We'll talk more about that as we go forward, but here we're just building our basic concepts. It's important, just as it was in propositional logic, to make sure 
that our sentence is well formed. In other words, just like with grammar, we want to make sure that our, our notation uh, makes for a meaningful, comprehensible sentence. And that's going to involve, in quantifier logic, the proper use of parentheses when the domain of discourse needs to be made explicit. What do I mean by that? Well, remember the universal quantifier and the existential quantifier say respectively every or and some. The question when we're looking at parentheses is how far across does our quantifier go? Let me try to explain by way of the example. Look at the sentence, all horses are equine. Notice that we have a universal quantifier immediately after that and just before an open parenthesis, there's an X. That's our variable. So you can read the sentence as follows for this first part. Every X or for every X. Then in parentheses, we have the predicate horse, the variable X, our conditional symbol, the predicate equine, the variable X, and then a closed parenthesis. The parentheses tell us that the X right next to the universal, to the immediate right of the universal, ranges across the entire sentence. So for every X, if X is a horse, then X is an equine. Now let's take a look at the existential claim. Some dogs are beagles. There is some X. That X is a dog and a beagle. We could also say there is some thing that is a dog and a beagle. So part of what we're doing here with the parentheses is we're demonstrating that the quantifier ranges over the entire sentence. When we don't have a quantifier, we say that the variable is free or it is unbound. As free or unbound, we have a non-sentence. In other words, suppose that you just see the predicate horse and the variable x. The best we can do, and even I'm doing more in saying the following than is actually expressed in that notation, is entity horse. Right? How many entities, we don't know because we don't have a quantifier. Now, you see in the third example, every cube is smaller than something, that we have two quantifiers. We're going to talk about this uh, in Chapter 11, but I thought I'd throw this out now so that you can see one way we can articulate uh, two in this case, different quantifiers, a universal and an existential. The reason I want to show this to you is to show you by way of the parentheses and the placement of the existential within the parenthetical, the scope of the quantifier. So we have universal x, cube x, arrow, existential y, smaller x, y. I do also want to point out, just so you can file this away, that even though I'm using different variables, x and y respectively, this does not tell me that we are talking about two different entities. More on that later, but just file it away. It will come back uh, as we discuss what we're talking about when we're using a variable, what we're talking about when we use multiple variables, 
and how we can get as specific as possible in our notation without recourse to individual names. So um, the, the feature of our prior uh, study, that is uh, the truth table feature of our uh, propositional logic connectives, more specifically uh, the Boolean connectives uh, for which we constructed truth tables, and then the uh, uh, extension of the concept of the truth table to the conditional and the biconditional does not apply in quantifier logic. In other words, uh, the truth values of quantified sentences are not built from constituent sentences and the meanings of the connectives. So what we want to think about um, is not that we can tell a sentence is true or false by simply plugging it into a truth table, uh, but to think about the quantifier semantics as um, being closer to the way in which we think about um, the fact that, let's say, the identity symbol and the semantics of the blocks language um, are, are resist, I should say, um, the, the functionality of the truth table. Now, um, there are two ways that we can check using Tarski's world the truth value of a quantified sentence. And uh, we can also engage in a discussion of how uh, we can test a sentence by uh, uh, effectively instantiating names. Uh, but for right now, let's just focus on the Tarski's world check. An existentially quantified sentence is true if and only if there is at least one object that corresponds to the well-formed formula. So we'd say something is a dodec, that would be an atomic sentence, that existential claim is true when in fact the world in question, in Tarski's world, uh, has at least one dodec. A universally quantified sentence is true if and only if every instance of the well-formed formula is true in a given world. So let's say we have the sentence, all dodecs are small. The world that that sentence is supposed to reflect is true if and only if every single one of the objects mentioned, the dodecs, are in fact small. So quantified statements are generally true or false relative to the domain of discourse or quantification. And that is the reason why we cannot plug as written a quantified statement into a truth table and churn out truth values successfully, that is accurately. In short, quantified sentences are not truth functional. All right, um, the following provides us with a nice set of ways of thinking about our four types of quantified sentence. In other words, we're talking about a standard translation for the universal affirmative, the universal negative, the existential affirmative, and the existential negative. Let's begin with the universal affirmative. All SRP can be restated as if anything is an S, then it's a P. Here's the translation. Universal X, open parenthesis, SX, arrow, PX. Now just for visual clarity, I haven't put the parentheses around the variables within the larger parenthetical. Um, but you'll know from Fitch and from Tarski's world that if you try to write it exactly this way, um, you, you'll get um, a, a, an error message because the programs will be confused. Um, but there's no reason why for visual clarity 
um, what I have here doesn't uh, suffice for right now. Let's now look at the universal negative. No SRP can be restated as if anything is an S, then it's not a P. Here's the translation. Universal X, SX, arrow, negation, PX. So before we move on to the existentials, let me just reiterate that these are your standard universally trans or sorry, rephrase. <laughs> these are your standard universal translations. Universal affirmative is standardly translated as follows. Your uh, grammatical subject becomes the subject class. Uh, it becomes the antecedent of a conditional claim. And your grammatical predicate uh, becomes the predicate class, that is the consequent uh, of the conditional claim. Notice that in some sense of the word predicate, your subject right becomes, as we're verbalizing the sentence, the subject becomes a sort of predicate, right? So we're talking about things, entities, at S, and things, entities, P. So of our domain of discourse, we're saying S of our domain of discourse, we're saying P. Notice also with the universal negative, the standard translation has the negation in front of the uh, consequent predicate. Now, the existential. Some SRP can be re restated as something is an S and a P. Existential X, parentheses, SX conjunction PX. Notice the following. The copula R in the universal claim, right, the conjugation of the verb to be in the universal claim becomes an arrow. So the relation between the S, S class and the P class uh, is expressed by the conditional. And notice that the uh, conjugation of the verb to be in the existential, that is the uh, R or the copula, is translated as a conjunction. These are your standard translation connectives. Notice finally that for the existential negative, we have once again the existential quantifier, we have the conjunction and we also have the negation on the right side of the connective conjunction. Just as in the standard for the universal negative, the negation is on the right side of the connective conditional. Now let's talk a little bit about some equivalences. We'll come back to these later, but Reading through these, I think, may help you make more sense of what the quantifiers mean, how we use negations, how we can express a universal in terms of an existential and vice versa. So, all S are P, or every S is P, is equivalent to, it's not the case, that there is even one S that is not a P. No S R P is equivalent to saying it is not the case that even one S is a P. Something S is P or some S R P is equivalent to saying it is not the case that if it is an S, then it's not a P. Another way to say the uh, sum S R P in universal terms is to say that it's not the case that no S R P. Lastly, some S are not P is equivalent to saying it's not the case that every S is a P. Now one of the things we'll do when we talk more about these equivalences 
is we'll think about what sorts of moves we can make in terms of truth functional equivalences that will allow us to uh, logically manipulate our sentence without disrupting the original structure. So again, file that away and we'll come back to it later. One last thing that we want to talk about is what happens when we have not just an atomic sentence and not just a two category sentence, but a multiple category sentence. What we want to do in that case is determine how many nouns are in the sentence, determine the scope of the quantifier, if there's more than one, and then determine also whether or not the sentence is mixed, that is, whether or not included in the quantified sentence there is an individual constant. Here are some examples. Take a look at each and then we'll walk through them together. You might want to pause the video for just a moment so that you can read and then see what it is that you're thinking about as we walk through this together. Our first example reads as follows. All students in the room are prepared. And then notice the parenthetical. The domain of discourse is limited to people. We're going to come back to uh, a discussion of the domain of discourse in a little bit. But for the moment, think about it this way. We're assuming in our translation that we're only talking about people so that we don't have to specify uh, uh, the predicate people, which would introduce another, in this case, letter to the uh, translation. So the translation looks as follows. For every X, if that X is in that room, then that X is prepared. Or even more uh, uh, exactingly, for every X, if that X is a student and that X is in the room, then that X is prepared. Notice that I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in a way that says the X is the same throughout that I'm not talking about different things when I am talking about the ver or when I'm enlisting the variable X. Now let's look at the second example. No unprepared students are happy. For every X, if that X is a student and is not prepared, then that X is not happy. Notice in our first two examples, that we've got the standard translation, right? Universal affirmative, universal negative, uses arrow or uses the conditional as, the, uh, as a reflection of the standard translation. In addition, the universal negative involves a negation on the consequent side of the conditional claim. The addition of, in this case, in the, both of these cases, the conjunction and the additional negation has to do with the fact that we are talking about two sets of thing, students and people in the room. We're also talking about students and people who are prepared, and in the negated sentence, we're talking about people that are not prepared, hence the negation in front of the people. Now let's take a look at our third example. Many deserving or in need students have scholarships. How many are we talking about of the students? We're talking about many, which is an existential. That is, there is at least one thing. The thing is a student. It is deserving or in need and has a scholarship. And then lastly, we've got an example of the mixed sentence that I mentioned in the last slide. We've got the individually named Fariba, but Fariba is involved with, or sorry, Fariba is involved in the sentence that is quantified. So we get Fariba does not sit to the left of any unprepared students. Notice each uh, translation. See which one fits better for you. They say the same thing but we've got two different quantifiers. Sentence number one 
uh, under the Fariba example says, it's not the case that there is something that is a student and not prepared and Fariba sits to the left of it or them. Second example, or second translation, sorry. For every X, if X is a student and not prepared, then it's not the case that Fariba sits next to them. I hope this overview of chapter 9 is helpful to you as you get started working on quantifier logic.